This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. When I listed the title of this message that you see in the bulletin that you have as the unfettered word, I began to have fears that perhaps it failed to convey the idea I wanted to express. So often we preachers are guilty of talking about something that's clear only to the preacher and to God. And some sermons I've heard made me wonder if the preacher knew what he was talking about. Well, that kind of situation might well be like the lady in Florida who was expressing to a friend one day some of her deep convictions. She said that she was violently opposed to capital punishment, especially for children, she said, because it might do them permanent damage. (laughs) Well, we're thinking today about the Bible, the unrestricted, unchained, unbound, unfettered Word of God. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, the apostle writes as he awaits his death, giving sound advice to young Timothy. From his prison cell, Paul says, Now Christ Jesus has come to offer us God's gift of undeserved grace. Christ our Savior defeated death and brought us the good news. It shines like a light and offers life that never ends. Paul continues to say, My work is to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering now. But I'm not ashamed. I know the one I have faith in, and I'm sure he can guard until the last day what he has trusted me with. That's 2 Timothy, 1st chapter, verses 10 through 12. Then Paul continues to say in the next chapter, chapter 2, Remember always as the center of everything, Jesus Christ, a man of human ancestry, yet raised by God from the dead, according to my gospel. For preaching this, I'm having to endure being chained in prison as if I were some sort of criminal, but they cannot chain the word of God. Moffat, in his translation, gives that last phrase, There's no prison for the Word of God. Another translation, New English Bible, says it this way, I'm shut up like a common common criminal, but the Word of God is not shut up. And in the message by Eugene Peterson, he says it this way, God's Word isn't in jail. And the word from which I get the title of today's message comes from the translation of the Revised Standard Version. I'm suffering and wearing fetters like a criminal, but the Word of God is not fettered. Oh, what a wonderful truth we need to hear, that the Word of God is not fettered. Now, strictly speaking, fetters are are shackles that are put around the feet, often used in binding prisoners. But the word usually means anything that binds or restricts motion. Paul knew exactly what he was talking about when he said that you cannot bind up or chain the Word of God. Foolish tyrants have tried to erase God's Word from the face of the earth. They would come closer to being able to erase heaven and earth. Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, said Jesus, but my words shall not pass away. Isaiah said, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. An American missionary accompanied by his little son was once visiting a Muslim mosque. As the two men stood with their guide in the center of the temple, underneath the great dome, the Mohammedan hour of prayer arrived. Far up above them from his place in the minaret, the muezzin sounded the call to prayer across that big city. There is one God and he is Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. His words resounded and echoed through the building. The missionary could not restrain himself. 
Raising his hands to his lips, he also sounded a cry. There is one God, and he is God, and Jesus Christ is his Son, King of kings and Lord of lords. And once again, the words echoed back and forth between the great walls of the mosque. King of kings and Lord of lords, King of kings and Lord of lords. The little son took all this in, then he pulled at his father's hand. And when the missionary looked down at his boy, the son was standing wide-eyed, still listening to the fading echoes of his father's words. The little boy said, they just can't stop it, can they, Daddy? They just can't stop it. No, they cannot stop it. This redemptive, transforming, powerful message of hope they will never stop it. Men may build iron curtains, burn church buildings, destroy Bibles, imprison God's people. They may laugh and ridicule and mock, but they will never stop the word of God. Not until the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. While the word of God cannot be fettered or stopped, yet its effectiveness in your life and mind can be weakened. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple examples of the way this can happen. One is by superstition and ritual. No respectable home would be without a Bible. And they're often found in prominent places, maybe on a coffee table in the living room, or, uh, these large, beautiful Bibles. Now, I find no fault in having a Bible in a home. But if this book serves only the purpose of having something for people to look at, this smacks of an idea of a superstitious good luck charm. <coughs> you perhaps have heard the story about a soldier who was hit in the chest with a small shell during combat. His shirt pocket contained a small New Testament with a metal front on it. The shell just happened to strike that New Testament, and the soldier survived. His testimony was, I will never go anywhere without the Bible in my pocket. It saved my life. I don't know how you feel. That, that certainly is a beautiful story. But it borders on voodooism. That soldier's life could have been saved just as effectively if he had had a deck of cards in that pocket or even a filthy paperback novel. God's word can work its work only when it is in our hearts, not just over our hearts. But some people still use it as a magic wand. Reading the Bible through superstition is not the way. Also reading the Bible only through ritual can weaken its effectiveness in your life. John Sutherland Bonnell of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City once said that he was talking with a lady about this matter. She said, Preacher, the Bible is a wonderful book. I just wouldn't think of commencing the day without reading my chapter. And the preacher asked her what she got out of her chapter that morning. Oh, one can't read the Bible without getting a blessing from it. She evasively answered, Minister agreed, that's right, yes, he said. But would you mind telling me what particular instruction or help you got today? Then the woman confessed that she was able to recall nothing at all from the reading of her chapter. Yes, daily Bible reading is a very good habit. But there's a danger that even this can become nothing more than an empty ritual in your life. Only you can make it meaningful. Not just reading words, but pondering the words and saying, God, what are you saying to me through this passage I've just read? Thus far, we have observed that God's word cannot be fettered, although its effectiveness can be diluted in one's life by such things as superstition or empty ritual. May I spend the few remaining moments today to give you some concrete, simple suggestions of ways in which you can bring God's Word to life in your own experience. In fact, let me invite you to join me in a plan of Bible study. Several steps. One, 
get a translation of the Bible in everyday contemporary language. I would say to get a modern translation, but that word modern has a bad ring to it. Get an up-to-date translation or paraphrase would be my advice. The King James translation is my favorite of all. It was written because there was a king in England in 1611 who wanted a translation of the Bible that he and others of his day could understand. And so for these 410 years since this translation has had center stage and it is unmatched in beauty of expression. But you know what? People just don't speak today the same way they did 410 years ago, do they? There are a number of good translations and paraphrases you might use in study. One of them, which is enjoyed by many, is one that I often use here at Ocean Lakes. It's a very popular one and it's provided only by the American Bible Society. You can't buy this in bookstores. And so for this reason, I have purchased a supply of these Bibles and I have them on sale at the back table back there. Some of you saw them as you came in. No profit is made on these Bibles. I don't want to do that. It's just cost recovery, what I've already paid for. Contemporary English version of the Bible, both paperback and hardcover. There are a number of other translations which have stood the test of time. No one translation or paraphrase is always the best. But God can speak to the heart of one who seeks his will through several ways. Our Bible study teacher, Dave Strove, can help you in choosing a translation that may be the best for you. Second suggestion, get a brief, practical Bible commentary. In this way, you can learn the background of the book of the Bible you're reading, the writer, his situation from which he wrote, his reason for writing, and other background information. Third suggestion, select one book of the Bible to study and stay with it. I would suggest that you begin in the Gospels rather than in the Old Testament. In the Gospels, you get the story of Jesus, who is the center of the Bible. It was said of Dwight L. Moody's preaching that no matter where his sermon started from in the Bible, he lost no time in hot-footing it to Jesus Christ. So begin with one of the Gospels, then go to Acts, which is Luke's account of the early church. And then maybe you can read Paul's letters, which he wrote to young churches. A fourth suggestion, give yourself time to read. Can you imagine what would happen if everyone here this morning would say, come what may, I'm going to spend at least 20 minutes every day with God's Word. You say you don't have time? There have been great people of our day and of days gone by who have said they were so busy they were forced to spend great periods of time with God's Word. A fifth suggestion. Use the Bible time not just for information, but also for inner formation. One of the best ways I know to do this is by getting involved in a regular Bible study with a good teacher. Now here's the commercial. <laughs> we have right here at Ocean Lakes a person who can guide you in practical Bible truths of Scripture. His name is Dave Stroll. This study that we offer each Sunday is non-invasive. He won't call on you to say anything, but it is quite helpful for anybody who's willing to spend 45 minutes a week and study, guided study of God's Word. 45 minutes a week. Is that too much to ask? <clears throat> Chuck Swindoll asks us to imagine you work for a company whose president found it necessary to travel out of the country and spend an extended period of time abroad. And so he says to you and to the other trusted employees, look, I'm going to leave. While I'm gone, I want you to pay close attention to this business. You manage things while I'm away. Now, I'm going to write to you regularly, and when I do, I will instruct you in what you should do from now until I return from this trip. All the employees agree. And so the man leaves. He stays gone for a couple of years. During that time, he writes often, 
communicating his desires and his concerns about the business. Finally, he returns. He walks up to the front door of the company and immediately discovers everything is in a mess. Weeds flourishing in the flower beds, windows broken across the front of the building, the gal at the front desk is dozing, music is roaring from several offices, two or three people engaged in horseplay in the back room. Instead of making a profit, the business has suffered a great loss. So without hesitation, he calls everyone together and with a frown, he says, what happened? Didn't y'all get my letters? You say, oh yeah, sure. We got all your letters. We, we've even bound them in a book. And some of us have even memorized your letters. In fact, we have letter study every Sunday. You know, those were really great letters you sent to us. I think the president of that company would then ask, well, what did you do about my instructions? And no doubt the employees would have to respond, do? Well, nothing, but we read every letter you sent. Is our Lord saying something to us in our failure both to read and to be informed from his word? Is our life formed and shaped by his teachings from the Bible? Is it just something we read? An old man, the president of a large corporation, was sitting in his office one day when he needed a Bible for some purpose. He sent a young messenger boy to bring him the book, the Bible. As the young boy stood before the old man, the president of that corporation said, Young man, you carry that book easily now in your youth. But when you are as old as I am, that book will have to carry you. Yes, the Bible does have carrying power. It will carry you through days of hardship as well as in days of joy. Holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure, thou art mine. Is it yours? Oh God, thank you for giving us your word, the Bible. May we cherish it, read it, absorb it, and let it be what you intend it to be to us. Thank you for giving us Holy Bible, your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.